Honey, I am so excited today. Do you have any idea as to why? Because Brittany is finally free. Uh, no, no, not Brittany. Honey, I'm a 53-year-old man. I don't follow anything with Britney Spears. I'm excited today because I just hatched a small clutch of chondros, and I cannot wait to show everybody the babies. That's why I'm excited. So why don't we just jump into today's video? But, um, honey, she was trapped by her father for like 13 years. I can't believe it's finally over. Welcome to video number 31, everybody. A lot has happened since I saw you guys the last uh, two, three weeks back. Um, first thing that's happened is I just recently hatched out a clutch of chondros. So today, in today's video, we're going to get into setting up those eggs and pipping those eggs and manually pipping those eggs and how to set up those babies after they hatch. And I'm also going to show you what those babies look like since they hatched and now that they shed. Um, but before we get into any of that today, I want to tell you guys key, three key things right now that are super important what you have to keep in mind when you're shipping animals. So if you've been shipping animals over the last month or so, you know that between FedEx just being super jammed up and being shorthanded, it is a recipe right now for disaster for shipping animals. So here's three quick things you need to keep in mind if you're going to ship animals between now and the end of the year. Um, I just shipped a box of Savu pythons out. It took them five days to reach their destination. Thank God they came in. They were perfectly fine, but I'll tell you it was a really stressful five days. And here's what I've learned. The first is always ship as early in the week as you possibly can. In fact, the best day to ship reptiles right now are is on a Tuesday. So why a Tuesday and not a Monday? Well, Monday, typically FedEx is making all the corrections from the previous week they shipped and they're still getting caught up and your box can get lost in the shuffle on a Monday. So I would not ship on a Monday. Tuesday being the next earliest day of the week, I would ship on a Tuesday. Uh, the next thing you need to do is don't use really small boxes. In fact, I would not use any box smaller than a 12 by 9 by 6. Anything smaller than that, it just increases your odds of that box getting lost in the shuffle. So shipping on Tuesdays, use a larger box. And thirdly, and most important is, if you can get access to them, make sure you ship. I think it's either a 70 or a 72 hour heat pack. Um, basically, when you ship animals right now, you should just assume that they're going to be in transit for minimally two days. I know it's supposed to be overnight guaranteed, but I would always plan on at least two, three, two days, maybe even three days. Therefore, that's why you need to use the longer heat pack or the heat pack that's going to last longer. Because with temps dropping and if your animal gets stuck up in one of the hubs, Memphis, for example, you want to know that the heat pack is going to be working for an extended amount of time. So again, if you are shipping animals now between now and the end of the year, I can't stress enough shipping early on the week, using larger boxes and using uh, heat packs that last 70 hours if possible. So incubating green tree python eggs and setting up those babies after they hatch. That's what we're going to talk about in this segment. First thing you guys may, may have noticed is that all my lights are off and my enclosure is behind me. That's because we are filming late at night. A bunch of baby green tree pythons just hatched and my wife and I are down here working tirelessly for everybody out there to shoot this video. Honey, can you believe we go through all this and some people still do not subscribe to our channel? It's just shame. Shame on them. But in any event, let's talk about incubating green tree python eggs. So, I use the no substrate method for incubating my eggs. And the thing I always make clear in my videos is that you might ask three different people, five different people, ten different people how they incubate their eggs. And you may get ten different answers, and I can promise you all will work. I'm just going to show you what works for me, and I'm going to go off that premise. So, I use this Cambro box couple inches of water on the bottom. I set my eggs on top of this fluorescent light grating. And uh, these are just these round PVC things you get on the plumbing aisle at Home Depot. And again, there are those SIM containers. A lot of you guys out there may use the SIM containers. I'm old school. I've had these forever. This is what works for me. So there are no air holes in this Cambro box. So what I will do is I will just set the eggs in here. I will put the lid on it. And for 39 days, I will let those eggs incubate at 87.4 degrees again for 39 days. On the 39th day, what I will do is I will lower my eggs by one temperature, one degree. So I will bring them down to 86.4 degrees. And at that point, they will incubate for another 10 to 11 days. And I could tell you when I do that, all my green tree python eggs always hatch between 49 and 50 days. So it's day 49 and your first green tree python baby has just pipped the egg. What do you do? Do you wait for the others to pip their eggs? Do you manually cut the eggs? What do you guys do? Well, I'll tell you what I do is after my first green tree python egg pips, I will wait about 12 hours, 15 hours. There's no set. It doesn't have to be any specific time. And I will go through and I will make a small incision into those eggs. I'm going to show you how I do that right now. I use these little pair of like, I don't know if they're toenail scissors, fingernail scissors. These eggs have already hatched. I'm going to show you the baby shortly. I know it's tough to see. There's a little slit right here, guys, and I'll literally go through, and maybe I'll just cut a little V like that, a tiny little pip, 
okay? We are not going like West Coast reticulated python breeder here. We're not slashing these eggs open and ripping the babies out. It's a tiny little incision. That's all we're going to do, a little V like that, and then I'll put them back in there, and I will let the babies hatch by themselves. So why do we do that? Why do we cut the eggs, and why do we not wait for them to come out by themselves? I hatch, I breed a lot of different pythons, as you guys know. I don't cut any of my eggs. But the biggest problem with green tree pythons is that any breeder will tell you is you get a lot of, for whatever reason, we do not know why, babies that are fully formed and dead in the egg. Last year I had 15 eggs. I hatched nine of them and six of the 15 were fully formed babies dead in the egg. Is it because the temperature is too high in the incubator? Well, that's why I lower the temperature by one degree. A lot of green tree python breeders do that. They'll lower it for the last 10 days, one degree. And even by doing that, sometimes you get babies dead in the egg. Um, the other problem is that does something happen with their egg tooth in captivity that they're not able to slit their eggs? Is there something with the eggshell that prevents them from slitting the egg? We really don't know. So it's literally just a process of elimination. I slit the eggs just because I know if I do that, at least I know they are not going to drown in the eggs. I mean, maybe there's another reason they died in the egg, but it's not going to be because it was too hot, and it's not going to be because um, their egg tooth uh, wasn't working and they couldn't slit the, slit the uh, inside of their egg. You know, it's funny because I recently posted something on Facebook talking about slitting green tree, tree python eggs and somebody had chimed in, I forget who it was, just mentioning two things. They said, you know, I think green tree, tree python breeders slit their eggs because they're greedy and they want their, you know, if a baby's weak, they want to help that baby come out of the egg. They're greedy. They want to sell the animal and make money. That's silly because anybody knows who breeds green tree pythons. We do not do it to make money. I mean, we could be, I could have a basement full of any other species of snake besides green tree python if I was doing this for the money. It's just that we're trying to increase our, um, our hatching rate of our babies. Um, the other thing they mentioned is that, you know, maybe the baby, if the baby's that weak and you have to cut the egg, maybe you're not supposed to cut the egg and in nature the animal would just die. Well, listen, nothing we do in captivity even resembles close to nature, okay? We, you know... Uh, king snake breeders, guys who breed like tricolor king snakes and mountain king snakes and, and milk snakes. I mean, they for many years, de decades, they've been scenting their prey items, uh, trying to get those animals to eat uh, commercially raised rodents as opposed to feeding them lizards or frogs. So we're constant, constantly manipulating these animals to thrive in captivity. So cutting the egg of a green tree python is no different as far as I'm concerned than scenting a prey item. And besides, even if a baby was really weak, a green tree python baby, even if you slipped the egg and the baby was weak, trust me, that baby would die before it left the egg or it would leave the egg and die. So they're only the strongest genetic baby green tree pythons are going to come out of these eggs, whether you cut the eggs or not. So just a couple things to keep in mind if you're debating of whether if you're going to cut your eggs open or not. I just see no downside at all with slitting your eggs. Again, as long as you just make a very small incision um, and you're not doing anything invasive with the baby, there is no downside at all. As far as I'm concerned, to, to cutting your eggs open after 12 hours or so, and uh, me personally, I will continue to do that as long as I'm breeding green tree pythons. The first baby green tree python has now pipped. Its head is out of the egg. The first thing I'm going to do, guys, is I want to get rid of all that water. That's the last thing I need is to produce some beautiful baby green tree pythons and have them drown the water. So the first thing I'm going to do is empty the water. I'm going to redo the entire tub now. And when I'm done redoing it, it's going to look something like this over here. And as you can see, i got a bunch of baby green tree pythons hatching right now. There's still one coming out of the egg. So I dumped the water out. I took a bunch of paper towel. I made it nice and damp on the bottom. And then, while the eggs are still in the process of pipping, uh, I'll just use an empty deli cup container, it's just a clear container, and I'll set the eggs on top of the container. And I do that just so that they're not sitting on top of the damp wet paper towel. Would it matter if you put them on top of the wet paper towel? I have no idea. I've just been doing it this way for years. It keeps the eggs nice and dry while it gives the baby some time to uh, hatch out. So as you can see, within usually 12 to 24 hours, once they start pipping, you'll see all the babies. I have a little perch in here for them. This is David Brahms. Specialty enclosure designs, and I'll throw one of these in there. And as you can see, um, as soon as they're hatch out, the first thing they want to do is climb. So I give them a place to climb to. So as you can see, there this was a total of six eggs. There are six babies, small clutch, but 100% hatch rate. I'll take it every time. All red babies. This is a Manaquari to Manaquari pairing. And uh, so now that the babies are come out of the eggs, let's talk about what do we do when they're done hatching? How do we set them up in individual containers? Okay, so very gently, we're gonna pry the baby green tree pythons off this purse, but before doing so, let's have their new enclosure already set up. As you can see down here, I use a simple shoebox, uh, a simple shoebox for my shoebox rack. And uh, again, David Brahms specialty enclosure designs purchase. You can call up David and he will make any size you need. 
Key thing here, guys, this paper towel on the bottom of this enclosure for this newly hatched baby green tree python is pretty wet. I mean, it's pretty saturated. I pour the excess water out, but it's pretty wet. You have an option. You can use wet paper towel like this on the bottom of their enclosure, or you could simply just use water on the bottom of your enclosure. Some people use water. I use damp paper towel, wet paper towel. The key thing is, here is that before these animals go through their first shed, they have to be damn close to 100% humidity. The last thing you want is for a baby green tree python to go through its first shed and have a dry shed on it. If you do that, it's super problematic and sometimes even wind up losing the baby. So I cannot stress enough, you need to keep that baby super humid at least till it goes through its very first shed cycle. So again, damp paper towel, small water bowl, perches, and here we go. This is always fun. We're just going to very slowly work one of these little babies off its perch. And we're going to take time, and there it goes. And you can see it's a little, little wiry there. Love it. It's a little feisty one. Come on, baby. Oh, come on, baby. And just like that. Oh, it's striking already. I love that. It's a good sign. Hopefully, it means it's going to be a good eater. Simply place it right in there. And after that, we're going to let it go through its first shed. After it goes through its first shed, there's no need to keep it as wet as I'm keeping it right now. So what I'll do is I'll switch from this damp paper towel to completely dry paper towel. Water bowl, same perch, same, every, same everything. The only difference now is that every morning, what I personally do with my baby green tree pythons, I actually spray them. My little mister, I spray them every single morning. I spray the animal itself, and I'll spray the back of the tub as well where the heat is to keep that humidity up. Again, you always want to keep that hum humidity at least to 60 to 65% with baby green tree pythons. It's crucial because, as we know, Baby green tree pythons are, pro, are prone to prolapsing, and simply by keeping them humid, 60 to 65 percent, 60 to 65 percent, we will really greatly reduce the uh, chances of them prolapsing. Okay, so everything that you guys had just had seen in that video that was shot about two and a half, three weeks back. And since that time, these are three of the six babies. All three of these babies have shed. Actually, all six babies have shed. Of my six babies, five have now uh, taken their first meal. Some have taken their second meals. Honestly, guys, I try to film them taking their first meals, um, but it's super challenging because, honestly, every time one of them grabbed a pinky and then I slightly moved, as you chondro breeders, green tree python breeders know out there, as soon as I made even the slightest move, the animals dropped their pinkies, and I just got super frustrated with it. So, again, I apologize because I really was trying to show you guys these animals taking their first meals. So again, all these babies have since shed. As you can see, they look great. I couldn't be happy with them. The one that we're showing you right now, that's actually gonna be the hold back of the six. Uh, it's a little darker than the others, a little heavier pattern, so I'll probably just hold that one back. So again, these are in their, they'll, they'll be in these enclosures for probably the next, I will tell you realistically, four months, something in that area, six months. And as I referenced earlier, this is what I now do with them every single morning. Um, the paper towels typically dry by the morning. It's still a little damp right now. Uh, we're filming at night. But what I will do is I'll just go in and you can just, I take a, my little sprayer gun here and I'll just a couple quick sprays right on the baby itself, a couple sprays in the back of the enclosure. That's where the heat tape would be, keeps the humidity up higher. Again, same with this one and the same with this one. And I'll do that to every single baby every single morning until they're at least three to four months old. And again, why do I do that? It's because we know baby chondros, when kept too dry, they are prone to prolapsing. So again, I cannot stress enough to keep those humidity levels up and keep the animals well hydrated. So that pretty much wraps it up from hatching out of the eggs and how I set them up and how they're going to be set up for the next six months. If you have any questions, please comment down below and I'll, be, uh, I'll do my absolute best to answer them for you. Guys, this is a 75% uh, diamond python. Okay. It uh, was uh, a gamma jaguar mixed to a pure diamond python. So the father is 100% and the dam is 50%. And I'm showing you guys this animal because, and actually if you go back and you reference two videos ago, and I'll put a link down below, of my complete collection tour of 2021, I show the parents of this animal. And I'm gonna show you guys this animal on a regular basis because it is gonna be outrageous. It's gonna basically look exactly like a diamond python, but it's gonna have the coloration of a gamma jag. And I am super excited to raise this animal and hold it back. It is a it is a female as well. So um, in any event, thank you guys as always so much for watching my video. If you haven't done so already, please like and subscribe those, to the videos and my channel. It helps me tremendously. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody in a couple weeks. Who has the best YouTube channel? Me?